Well, Keen, and I, I want to have his voice because we're not we're not doing amplified. And Joe's voice is like a built-in microphone. That's fantastic. So, oh, audience of the age, oh, hail fellow pragmatic mystics. No speakable content could be found on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> and and the aliens and space aliens. <laughs> 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 so, yes. So, so I, I love I love that the uh, the the amplifier and the microphone weren't working because Mercury is stationing just for the fun of it um, and a little preface to what we're up to. Uh, so some years back, uh, I was invited to a, a water conference, which was the world leading engineers on water. Uh, it was sponsored by Bill Hazeltine, who made a whole lot of money on GenTech and the Swedish Embassy. Uh, and the night before, I looked at their website and it said Caroline Casey will be leading a water blessing ceremony during the lunch. I'm like, oh my god, these are scientists. <clears throat> I'm not going to mention the astrology up front. Um, and then wondering how things would self-assemble. So before we began, somebody gave me a bunch of yellow roses. And I go, well, that's perfect. Yellow roses are sacred to Oshun in Vudun, the goddess of sweet water. And we were right on the banks of the Potomac. Uh, so the scientists were all talking. And I knew <clears throat> with, their, with their lunch, and I knew I just had one <clears throat> moment to kind of grab them. And I said, you know, in our mythological DNA, in everyone's bones and blood, lives the myth of the restoration of the waters of life. And they all stopped. They, they wanted that part of them spoken to. You know, and I, then I told them everything I knew in, <clears throat> in about <clears throat> five minutes, um, and then invited them to all go down to the Potomac River. And this was like Coast Guard and Homeland Security and stuff, <laughs> grown-ups. Um, and I gave them all the yellow roses, and they all were quite happy to throw the yellow roses into the Potomac River by way of apology to water and a willingness to work with water to heal water. Wow. And then that night at the party, you know, Indian engineer came up and said, I am a strict science engineer, but you gave me permission you know, to, to be everything. You know, and then the <coughs> excuse me, America's cold, cold fusion physicist uh, came up and said, well, all physicists are mystics. And then everybody wanted to be a mystic at the party. Uh, and then um, the, the next day, uh, there was a, a man who had invented a machine that ran on one tablespoon of gasoline and the rest on water. But mercury was stationing retrograde, so it wasn't working. You know, and there was press and everything. Um, and the cold fusion physicist stepped up and said, I think it needs more pressure, and he leaned on it, nothing. And I just, this is, this, is, this is the idea of us being dedicated and just stepping into the moment. I just saw the path unfurling for Trickster, and I stepped forward, and I put one hand on the machine and one hand on the inventor, and I asked the inventor, do you vow that this technology will never be used for war? And he said, I do. And the machine went va va boom and sprang to life. Wow. <laughs> and all of the scientists were so happy and liberated that it wasn't just them, right? So, and, and it was a serious conference, right? The, the morning was the problems and the afternoon was the solutions, which are grave. I mean, the Ganges might stop running and they said that will make war look like a picnic and many other things. But so here we are to address these things. So I have, I have Muti. Muti comes from the South, South African Sangomas, the medicine people. And Muti means power and medicine, reminding us that true power you know, is that which heals. So this Muti is comprised of tobacco from Syria when it was still beautiful, and coyote hair, because everything I own is suffused with coyote hair, because I lived with an actual coyote for 19 years. So we say it <coughs> with, the, with the Muti, O oh, spirit of the compassionate trickster, residing in each one of these beautiful hearts, Open the path for each one of us that we may cultivate, animate, and contribute our considerable gifts to the community at this time of dire beauty, you know, in a way that has the most serious possible fun. And then um, the Sangomas also grew this special. They said, this is only for medicine people, but if you meet with medicine people, people whose hearts are dedicated, you may use this. And this is another kind of muti. It's called umpepu. And it's, uh, it's uh, just a little bit of lighting the thing. Um, this opens the avenues between the living and the dead, between backstage and onstage, between the visible and the invisible. So by telepathic communion, we are all that from South Africa. So I love Terry Pratchett's uh, line. He says, here we are in this little circle of firelight we call the physical world, right? Surrounded by vast, pulsing mystery. Uh, and I, I've lived with a coyote longer than I've lived with a human. Uh, it's kind of like a fairy tale. <coughs> but um, so, uh, 
I'm not fond of humanism, so I'd like to say, you know, may the, may the truth of animism, everything's alive and worthy of respect, eclipse the hubris of humanism. <laughs> so, so here we are. <clears throat> what a fantastic time. I just want to weave the, the sky earth story uh, of what we've all been doing. So this new moon, which was on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, followed by the vernal equinox, is a time, uh, particularly auspicious, when humans would gather for at least 25,000 years you know, to determine what did they want to bring alive at the vernal equinox, you know, and what did they want to protect. And it reminds us, uh, it behooves us to animate uh, what is being proffered to us, lest we leave it by default to the Dementors of Doom, bless their hearts. You know, it was on the vernal equinox that George W. Bush began bombing Iraq on Persian New Year, you know, lambing the day most sacred to life, and we go, ah, so we are here to eclipse and hoover that. So what do we want to protect, what do we want to bring alive? So St. Patrick's Day, the new moon in Pisces, whose image, because there are images for each degree of the zodiac, is a vision of peace. You know, and there's a wonderful tale told about St. Patrick, that he was invited to a dinner where he's given a cup of poisoned wine. So he doesn't drink it and become a martyr, nor does he throw it down in, you know, in a fit of tantrum yoga. What he does is he holds the poisoned wine up to the light. Oh, there we go. He holds the poisoned wine up to the light. The poison rises to the top like froth on a Guinness. He blows off the poison. He quaffs the drink and toasts everyone, including those who tried to poison him, causing the elders to go, ooh, a real initiative. So I love that story because, you know, it comes right at the end of winter, spring, here we are. We've all been given a poisoned cup of wine, personally and collectively. You know, and so what do we do? We hold it up to the light, the poison rises to the top, we blow it off like froth, you know, and we quaff the drink and we toast everyone, including those who tried to poison us. What a good idea. So the mythological and the secular are completely, hilariously interwoven. Because March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, the new moon, is also Stormy Daniel's birthday. <laughs> uh, it, it was also, you know, right before then, it was, you know, the death of Stephen Hawking, who, was, who, who loved saying that he was born on the, th on the 300th anniversary of the death of Galileo. Genu he was born January 8th, 1942. And he died on Einstein's birthday, which is Pi Day, 3.14. So we, we love all that. But back to Stormy Daniels. <laughs> uh, so she was given a cup of poisoned wine in a sense. Um, and she's holding up the light. I, I follow her on Twitter and Instagram. I love her. They, because one of the things that's really good, I have not seen her oeuvre, um, but, um, but one of the things that, that is genius about her on Twitter is that she spirals with anything hateful or horrible coming to her. She meets it with incredible agility, you know, and, and trickster humor and does not go into polarity and whatever, all of those things. So Venus is returning, we're in that cycle of Venus returning. Uh, we know the, that uh, cultures stash their scientific knowledge in myths, in symbolically encoded in myths and fairy tales. So the anonymous is the Venus astronomical cycle. And, and all cultures would have known this. So, so Venus uh, would be the morning star for nine months, people notice this and then get so close to the sun that we don't see her, called Venus going to the underworld. And then, here's the cycle we're in, she would emerge as the evening star of peace you know, for, for, for nine months, which is what she's doing right now. So all cultures would have watched, like, well, what is this cycle? So Venus emerged in the sign of her exaltation, Pisces, reminding us that we have a small task before us to transform a culture of war and ding battery you know, into a culture of ingenious, compassionate response. And the, the backstage gods go, do that by lunch, and we've got some other projects for you, but you know, <laughs> like, here we go. Um, so, so, and then Venus entered Aries which, with, with Mercury, and I haven't seen her yet because it's cloudy, but right after sunset you can see Venus and Mercury, which is rare to see Mercury. You know, so Venus emerges with Mercury, with a mouth, right, uh, in Aries, which is kind of kick butt. So Venus is back, and we go, in praise of all spicy vixens, right, uh, the kind of... Uh, um, Stormy Daniels and um, and also all spicy vixens throughout time. I, I don't know how many of you might know about Veronica Franco and this quite wonderful movie called Dangerous Beauty. Anybody who's seen this? It's really great. It's a historical movie um, about Veronica Franco who is one of the very few women we know of who was accused of witchcraft by the Inquisition and who beat the rap. 
<laughs> um, and it, apparently all true. So she was a courtesan and a poet in Venice, and she's called up before the Inquisition, and she doesn't go submissive. She goes woofy, right, which is the quality of what's emerging now. And she says to the Inquisition, all my life I have never bowed to the worst fate that can befall a woman, which is to be of utter inconsequence. Bar. Right? And it, her woofiness inspires the otherwise cowardly men of Venice, all of whom she slept with, the bishop and the <laughs> you know, to, to stand up and back her up, causing the Inquisition to say, the entire city of Venice is damned, and we're packing our bags and leaving. <laughs> causing the entire city of Venice to go, carnival! <laughs> so, so all spicy vixen leader women, you know, and Scooter, you're part of that spicy vixen woofy Virgo, which are magic women, uh, and I love I love the Virgo because it's like ritual magic or obsessive compulsive disorder. Take your pick. You know. <laughs> um, so so part of also what what I love about Stormy Daniels because everything's real, everything's mythic, everything's speaking to us in the large collective dream, is that because I follow her on Instagram, I saw she she's a very serious horsewoman, um, and I saw one of the most beautiful pictures I've ever seen of her with her horse as one being making this incredible steeplechase jump. It's just gorgeous. And it reminds us, she, she's a Pisces, of course, and Elizabeth Taylor was a Pisces, and they both had a lot of things with horses, the Pisces horse connection. But there's this fun quote I found rummaging in a pile of things in my office. Uh, it's by Augustus W. Harry. He says, half the failures of this world arise from pulling in one's horse as he is leaping, which is kind of fun. Right? Isn't that fun? And we can all think back, because it's a time right now where we're all having past life review of every chapter of our life, or lives, or whatever. You know, um, and, and we can feel that, too, when the wave came and we're like, no, too big, and backed off. You know, or the horse was leaping, and we're like, no, not ready. You know, and we go, well, right now, in, in ways we want to animate the, the guiding story, cooperators are standing by, really, to help us humans out. Um, so. Uh, you know, we go, right, we, we, can, we can think of all those moments where we balked. And right now, we want to be kind of like, you know, we want to not pull in our horse as it's leaping. We want to leave and spiral forth from, from this powerful gathering with complete, you know, sky, earth, backup, going, whoa. Um, so, we, we love that. Um, so, uh, I also, you know, I'm, I'm, I do social media for sure. Um, and I find it wonderful according to what one's angle of relating to it. But on uh, Twitter, there's uh, somebody who tweets Chaucer, and it's quite great. Uh, and Chaucer does tweet, if you want to follow him. Uh, and he says, uh, fall down seven times, get up six. On seven, find a secret skull that teaches magic. Learn magic, make friends, have adventures. And then he says, a poem is sustainable energy for wonder. So, wonder is a great fuel to run on. As we get into the, what the planets represent, let me just say that, in this beautiful astrological language, each planet represents a quality of living intelligence that resides within us and connects us to the world. Yeah, um, and so the model is, I, I love the word <coughs> endogenous, right? Endogenous means we have internal receptors. We have endogenous receptors for cannabis, endogenous receptors for DMT, uh, and I think we have endogenous receptors for mythology as well. So if you know astrology or don't know astrology, I will, I will mention it some, but always translate it, but, but feel that inside it, we all have endogenous receptors. You know, as I mentioned, the planets, they come alive going, oh, in each one of us. So um, he also says, in a world of petty cruelty, be defiantly lovely and court wonder as a strategy, which is, Fun. Um, so, the outer planets, Neptune, Uranus, and Pluto, large by energetic symbolism, even if not by mass in Pluto's case, they represent huge forces of nature's evolutionary genius. And they're the keepers of the whole big frame story, social frame story, but even biological frame story that we're all a part of. And when they dance with us, and they're all dancing with us, you know, they're tapping each one of us on the shoulder going, You're all, we're all part of a big thing right now. So Neptune, dreams, vision, imagination, is how a culture tells itself its own story, through the images that move through group mind that I like to call the memosphere. And it's also been said that the purpose of ritual magic is to spiral into group mind expanded wisdom and tolerance for expansive download. So Neptune kind of themes 
you know, a, a culture. You, you can see it, you know, in the 1920s, Neptune was in Leo, the roaring 20s, in October of 1929, it entered Virgo, going parties over. <laughs> so now, for the first time in 165 years, Neptune's in its home realm of Pisces that we just had the new moon in, which is the repository of everything that's ever moved humans to conscious kinship. Um, and so Neptune and Pisces represent everything that mainstream culture has dissed, undervalued, exiled, suppressed, but said to be where a culture's soul or its replenishing spirit lives. And so Neptune and Pisces, the way I think about it, is that all the critters on this planet convene backstage going, humans, what are we going to do? We've got to either kill them or heal them. Let's try healing them first. Or a little bit of both, maybe. But let's try healing them. You know, again, let's make everything that has ever moved humans to conscious kinship, everything that has ever invited them back into the choreography of creation, available for fresh expression. Um, so, you know, just playing, or playing around with the, the, the shuffling of the notes, too. But uh, I like to say, you know, tyranny is compensatory weenie-dom. Right? Uh, I think I'll make a bumper sticker out of it. Um, <laughs> and um, so, you know, and, and, and we have, you know, things on our, our, our work table, too. So, you know, the horrific realms of, of torture, you know, and um, we'd say, what's the difference between Stormy Daniels and the CIA nominee, Gina Haspel, who is a torture queen? Uh, and we go, well, one is engaged in horrific pornography, you know, and the other is Stormy Daniels. Um, so, so it's like, what's the difference between the Hindenburg and Rush Limbaugh? One's a flaming Nazi gas bag and the other's a dirigible. Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, we're up against the dark conspiracy to make humans stupid. There was an interesting neuroscience article recently that was looking at, you know, uh, right-wing evangelical people, and they, they, they noticed there was a functional impairment in the prefrontal cortex uh, which diminishes cognitive flexibility, curiosity, creativity, and open-mindedness. And we go, help us team, help us team, again for the prefrontal cortex. And so we say, well, how shall we get from the horrific to the desirable? And what do we need against all odds? Enter liberating trickster, my primary definition. Um, and uh, trickster is, you know, we say trickster is that quality of ingenuity uh, in nature that loves against all odds, that is nature's experimental genius, that has no category about success fails. Like, try that, try that, try that. It does not worry, you know, will humans think I'm silly if I put big ears on this mammal? It says, no, we're gonna try it and see if the little critter lasts for a couple million years. <laughs> try that. You know, so, um, you know, and it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's part of also our, our dynamic of being agents, aspiring agents of the compassionate trickster. And, so we critique and bless as part of the dynamic. And we say, uh, what would be a blessing for someone contemplate, for someone plotting cruelty? But there's so many school shootings and the bombings and the thing and the horror and the addiction to boom. You know? And so, for instance, just to prime the pump of our own creativity, we might say, you know, may a bevy of therapeutic golden retrievers roll you around and lick, <laughs> lick away the scar tissue from the innocent dignity of your child heart. For instance. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, um, so, um, you know, demons like being named, you know, when somebody is really annoying, I, I was teaching a course in India just now, and um, it was pretty great, but there was one kind of, oh, you know, the, the kind of person who says, can I speak to you privately, and you're like, oh, no. And it took up a lot of headspace, and I was like, oh. And then, but once I named it, I go, oh, she is possessed by the vampire demon of impositional melancholy masquerading as weakness. And so I go, oh, now that I've named it, I feel much better. But then, <laughs> but then that's, but that's not where to end. You go, well, what do demons want? They want what we all want. They want to be liberated, you know? And so we wish the demons liberating. And myths, fairy tales, and detective novels are full of this. Milarepa, the greatest saint in all of Tibetan Buddhism, was a murderer and a highwayman. And so this quality of redemption, you know, is a, is a crucial theme. So what I wanted to say about Neptune and wonder, and for all the Pisces parts of ourselves here, Neptune transits. These big transits, Neptune, Uranus, and Pluto, are deconditioning. Uh, and so Neptune, the, the, the alchemy, it says, uh, dissolution is the secret of the great work. Dissolve certainty. Be available to mystery. Solve e coagula. Dissolve and reimagine the whole thing. So Neptune, as it dances with each one of us in different ways, 
says, um, in the modern world, wonder, mm, you know, would like to make a comeback, but the modern world's been kind of addicted to certainty, and as we know, certainty is a booby prize. Uh, so, but, but it's all kind of changing, because everything's in upheaval and collapse and, and whatnot. But to the ancient world, not knowing was considered a fantastic accomplishment. You know, and so Neptune says, we recommend you guys and Gaia's run on the fuel of wonder. We wonder. Because even the physical mudra of wonder, when we hold our arms up, you know, it turns our body into a magnetizing, beseeching chalice of inquiry that then attracts inspiration. We wonder. So wonder is very big now. And Stella Coyote, my companion of 19 years, two months and two weeks, uh, an actual coyote with whom I was assigned this experiment, but we came up with our own trickster creation myth. Uh, it's Bodhisattva Coyote. And so it's Bodhisattva Coyote creation myth that says, um, long before there were humans, there was trickster, who sets the whole thing, the whole shebang going with a sizzle of lightning. And this quality of uniqueness and ingenuity, nature's ingenuity, goes through all the flora and fauna, you know, and every now and then it's priesthooded or orthodox or imprisoned, you know, so it becomes a great ingenious escape artist, escapade artist. And it sizzles all the way into each one of our hearts really right now, this quality. And um, so, yeah, so, so there's that. And, um, and, and it's, again, trickster is disruptive and liberating, and it's part of the Venus return cycle, which is what is unique to the Venusian hero or heroine. In Mesoamerica, Venus is Quetzalcoatl. So it's, all, all the gods are kind of bisexual. Um, but, but the Venusian hero is interested in lifting the curse from the land, protecting what needs protecting, but liberating even the tyrant who has hardened their heart. Not counting on it, but willing. Yeah. And, um, and it's also, you know, um, uh, it's, it's again to disrupt things with humor. I, I love uh, Steve Behrman, who, who was, uh, pho photograph was up here, because I guess he visited the Rhine Institute. Um, but uh, Steve, one of Steve's quips is, sure, it works in practice, but does it work in theory? So trickster, again, we take everything from nature, because part of what we're moving to, again, you know, death or renaissance, a renaissance of ingenious ingenuity, of humans humbly cooperating with nature's guiding genius. And so to derive everything from that. So when conflicting forces come together in nature, nature creates a spiral. You know, and I asked a, a mythological meteorologist, you know, what do hurricanes want? And he said, well, they want what we all want. They want peace. You know, and so they take these conflicting forces to move them to the North Pole. So the increasing storms, and we will be getting more, you know, are just speaking to us about the enormous imbalance of what we have thrust and imposed upon our kin, just this world. But it also gives us a clue you know, about spiraling, you know, Aikido, Sufi whirling, you know, atoms, the originating spark. Uh, and part of our assignment also is about everything, to track everything back to its originating, liberating impulse before it was bamboozled, hoodwinked, you know, uh, uh, imprisoned in any way, you know, and offer ourselves to that. So, Uranus represents ingenuity, trickster, coyote, raven, seeds that sprout after cataclysm. It's, it's, nature, it's the part of us that likes against all odds. Other parts of us don't, but, but in crisis, trickster comes alive. You know, and um, the last ideas associated with, with Uranus are democracy, equality, synchronicity. And years ago I was wondering, well, what do those guys have to do with each other? And immediately events arrange themselves synchronously to reveal that, you know, when we treat each other as equals with a kind of ally etiquette, meaning we all have different roles on stage and backstage, but a fundamental respect. And the word respect means to look again. Re is again, spect is looked, right? So, with a fundamental respect, and it doesn't mean being nice, because nice, co <coughs> nice comes from nescient, which means ignorant, right? But it doesn't mean spicy. So we want a kind of fully informed compassion with sizzle. You know, as Wendell Berry says, be jaunty even though you know the facts, right? So, so when we treat each other as equals, the rate of synchronicity increases dramatically. It's just something to, to play with. When we look down at somebody or up at somebody, no, no magic, no synchronicity. Mm -hmm. So this is great sporting news for the transformational culture. Mm -hmm. The Dementors of Doom may have more money and more lawyers, but we, if we treat each other well in a spicy way, 
have synchronicity. You know, and again, the whole quality of nature, you know, with our with our backup. So um, uh, <clears throat> it, it's um, the, the spiraling quality of trickster would say, how about you humans, you know, since Pluto's offering everybody a huge composting cauldron, uh, and we all under our chairs have invisible gifts, uh, which include your portable harumphatube composter, um, because <laughs> communication really happens better once one is composted harumphatube, uh, and all the gods backstage go, hey humans, how about giving up addiction to having an enemy, which is a strict polarity. Wouldn't that be fun? You know, just as a, you know, go for it. Polarity into cauldron, spiraling out of cauldron. You know, and there's a wonderful learned druid, uh, John Michael Greer, who says, if you want people to get nothing done but conflict, convince them they're on one side of something. You will only get hot conflict. Rah, rah, rah. What two needs is three. And here we are, are all, the unifying story. We're all in this dream together. So may it be also that everyone here be irresistibly eloquent and magnetizing for the realm of what they're dedicated to. So we do love that. Um, you know, <clears throat> Ursula Le Guin, recent ancestor, says we strengthen whatever we oppose, right? So spiraling and surprise. And so this means also kind of filling up our magic backpacks with a whole range, ever-expanding range of responses. We want to be first responders as opposed to first reactors, right? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of first reactors. Um, the, the wonderful word cool, uh, popularized by jazz musicians in the 40s, uh, is a Yoruba word, kulu kulu. And it means completely responsible. That, that's what cool means. Mm -hmm. um, and in Yoruba, it also means cool, like temperature, <coughs> like it does in English. And so, uh, so the Yoruba say words are magic, as we know, and so they say, to literally, we can do this now, imagine head as cool, heart as warm, putting all the heat in the head, moving it, <coughs> moving it down to the heart, which is the opposite of road rage, right? Um, and allows us to be responders, uh, agents of cool response in a hot, reactive world. So my friend Corey, who, who is a, a substitute teacher in Oakland in some rough schools, he was taking attendance and there was a huge guy in the back of the class who wouldn't give his name. And Corey said, hey man, I'm sorry, if you don't give me your name, you can't be in the class. And the guy pulled out a gun. Um, and everybody dove under their desks. And Corey just stood there and said, hey man, I'm flattered. I'm flattered you want to be in the class that much, right? And, and, it, and it cracked the guy up and they became best friends and it became Corey's bodyguard and on like that. Um, so, you know, how to again be responders and disrupt. It only takes one person to disrupt the whole thing. You know, and something I, I've used a lot, but none of you have ever heard me before, but I love this so much. I was talking to a man who, uh, maybe a decade ago, who was in charge of uh, setting up all the UN refugee camps. And at that point, everything was used. I mean, it's a world of refugees, humans, animals, trees, everything right now. And he was, uh, the week before, colleagues of his had been killed, I think it's in Zaire, uh, had been murdered and found. Um, and he and his colleagues are walking back, uh, and they're kidnapped. They're, they're shoved into the back of a van, uh, guys with AK-47s, you know, bloodshot eyes pointing them, and they really thought they were going to die. But my friend uh, said to his colleagues, we've got to change the story. We're not being kidnapped, we're being helped. <clears throat> so, <coughs> so they thanked their captors. Wow, thank you so much for keeping us safe in this really complex environment, and their captors were puzzled, right? <laughs> but that night, you know, the captors locked them up and said, don't worry, you know, we're putting a guard outside so you'll be safe, and three days later, let them go. So just something, to, again, to take away in your magic backpack, at any moment, you know, we've got to change the story, story rewrite. We're going backstage, we're no longer victims, now we're kind of clueless, wandering people. You're no longer thugs and murderers, now you're heroes, back on stage, let's go. Yeah, and so it's just, these are useful things to play with, you know, and all the myths and fairy tales are really deeply wanting to, to, um, to speak to us now. The, the Mabinogi and the Welsh uh, creation myths, or kind of Arthurian legends, they were gathered in the 10th century, but really they're older. But there, there's a great moment where the elders get together and go, uh-oh, the men just found out they have something to do with children, and things were going so well before this. Um, <laughs> and we can see what's going to happen. Women will become property, you know, and humans will le lose kinship not only with each other, but with nature herself until the earth might die. But then, at that point, 
There are some humans who will keep all the value of their individual, individual, individual journey, but join once back in the whole large dream and dance, and then the earth might be saved. So it's like they're lobbing it to us, right? So also the Arabian Nights, which I love so much, again, the great uh, heroine Shahrazad, by her eloquence and storytelling, saves the land, liberates even the, the psychotic tyrant. Um, but at the heart of the Arabian Nights, uh, just a little fragment of you know, a great story, the tale of Princess Perizada. But it's also about manners. You know, in fairy tales, manners, respect, synchronicity has a lot to do. So Perizada's brothers have set forth to attain the waters of life, the talking bird, and the singing tree. You know, but at the base of the mountain that they have to climb, there's an old beggar. And the beggar says, you know, what is your business? And they're an important business, old man, out of our way. So they are soon dead. Um, so Perizada, uh, which means fairy born, sets forth, and at the base of the mountain she encounters the Sufi beggar and says, good sir, do you have any advice for me? And he says, you know, nobody has ever asked me that before. This is looking good. And he says, yes, as you go up the mountain, there will be voices hurling customized insults at you. And you must not react. You must not turn around. If you do, your heart and then your body will be turned to stone. And she says, well, what if I stuff my ears with chamomile? He goes, oh, you're very clever. This is looking good. Yeah, stuff your ears with chamomile. So as she goes up the mountain, you know, the voices are hurling customized insults. You know, you neoliberal, you Trump supporter, you fat guy, you whatever it is. You know? um, and, <clears throat> so, and as she goes up the mountain, she sees all those who could not resist reacting, whose hearts and then their bodies had been turned to stone. And so she gets close to the top of the mountain, the talking bird is there, and he's hurling even more, you know, customized insults. Going in, and she's like, no. And then she gets to the top, and they all go, well done, this is fantastic, and you don't need to cut the tree, here's a little cutting of the singing tree, and I'm the talking bird, I'll hop on your shoulder, you know, and here's the waters of life to restore the world, you know. And she goes, but what about my brothers? I'm so sorry. And he goes, no problem, you know, just use the waters of life, sprinkle it on them as you come down. So not content with just that, as she comes down the mountain, she sprinkles the waters of life on all those who could not resist reacting, you know, whose heart and body had been turned to stone, and she brings them all back to life. And she comes down, followed by the throngs of the, of the reborn, you know, and the talking tree and the singing thing, and the waters of life, and the world is reborn. That's the very short version of it. Um, but it's, again, not being distracted, uh, but reactive, uh, not being distracted or reactive. You know, and it's it, with all the kind of you know fake news and Macedonia and all kinds of things, um, you know, and social media is dodgy, which is anything you click on, like or hate, feeds it, right? And the 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 fake news guys, you know, uh, Breitbart and Bannon and 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 then these these uh, hubs in, in Macedonia that really send stuff out. Um, they they themselves in Macedonia had no political agenda. They just wanted to make money. And they noticed that hatred made more money, right? So that's why they went into that thing. And we go, right, so, so whatever we click on, we're feeding, you know, in some way. Um, now, part of, um, part of the dynamic of now, I'll just say a little bit about astrology. Ju Jupiter represents, you know, how we tell stories. It is curiosity. Uh, it is the power of uh, research and journeying and travel and blessing. It is in Scorpio now. Um, which is deep delving. It's stationed and is now retrograde, meaning just it's apparent, it's an illusion, but it's apparent motion from the Earth is backwards. And I like thinking of a planet representing a principle when it's retrograde, any RE activity, reconnect, retrieve, release, all of those things, you know, going <clears throat> backwards. And it, um, it's stationed at 23 plus Scorpio. There's images for each degree of the zodiac. The image for that is uh, a person delivering a sermon on a mount. So it says, well, we all, everyone here, has a sermon on a mount to deliver. And, and I sometimes work with Neil Douglas Klotz, who's an Aramaic scholar, and says, the language that Jesus would have spoken was Aramaic, the vernacular of that time. And it's this beautiful metaphoric language, you know, uh, nature-based. And he said, when you translate it into Greek, it kind of, it gets stripped of a lot of its metaphoric sensuality. He says, for instance, what comes to us as blessed are the meek, used to justify all kinds of hierarchical nonsense. He says in Aramaic, it's more like, blessed are those who soften emotional rigidity within their hearts, for they shall have all the power of nature. Mm 
And that's something you can really work with. You know, I've read that. I've read on. I've read that on the radio. I, I have a show of 22 years. Coyote Network News. You can access the archives for free. You know, it's critique and solution. But but um, but after I read that, somebody called up going, "I'm a lesbian separatist, man hating, religion hating, you know, witch." But I love that. <laughs> so you know, and and so he said, "Blessed are the peacemakers." He says, "Pretty close." But in Aramaic, it's "Blessed are those who plant peace." You know, may all of our metaphors be nature-based. You know, and I work with a lot of you know action teams and people on the street and uh, in other ways and fairy godmother of Code Pink and stuff. You know, um, and people are like, no, you know, uh, let's we're going to destroy the coal plants. Like, no, no, let's compost it. You know, let's compost these things into nutrient for the desirable. Let's derive all of our you know metaphors from from nature. So Jupiter's stationing, 23 plus Scorpio retrograde going, let's retrieve, let's go back, let's go backwards in, in many ways, let's revisit things. How did we get to this, you know, horrific pickle where we as humans have outsourced, you know, positions of leadership and power to sociopathic dingbats who've lost all sense of kinship? How did we get here? You know, um, we go, there's a lot of answers to that um, and a lot of things, but, it, but it's useful for everyone to wonder, you know, and, um, you know, uh, a guest on the radio recently was uh, was saying, you know, 4,000 years ago, the Greeks got rid of uh, you know most of their animal gods and went to strictly human gods. And I go, hmm, that may be, might be a fork in the road we might want to revisit. It might have been a necessary fork in the road, you know, for humans to go, humans, rah rah, humans, humanism, rah rah rah, you know. But now maybe it's time to revisit that, you know, animistic um, kinship. There's a Thai saying that says. Because we were never colonized, we never lost our animism, our sense of, you know, everything's alive and available for cooperation. So Jupiter will retrograde all the way back to 13 plus Scorpio, a degree that I really love. It's Edward Snowden's moon, um, and because um, uh, his birth time is available. And um, uh, the image for that, first, first think Edward Snowden, because again, there are images, metaphors for each degree of the zodiac. For the, so the image for Edward Snowden's moon, is telephone linemen at work installing links to other realities, the cosmic switchboard. And we go, well, he's a mogul, but he did a good job, you know. Um, but, but for all of us, you know, the cosmic switchboard, Jupiter goes back, you know, retrieve, you know, and then begins to go forward. And just for the fun of it, Uranus, trickster ingenuity, will enter Taurus, which is the realm of living, sensual, everything's alive, animism, you know, on May 15th, which is also a new moon in Taurus. And I find that heartening, as though, Earth herself is saying, we're not even waiting for the humans. You know, who wants to cooperate? And I'm so in love with the work of Janine Benyus and the work of biomimicry. Do people know this term, biomimicry? It's, it's, we, we all have so many colleagues we haven't met yet. We're just one inch apart. You know, and this confluencing of allies is so crucial. Because your work and your dedications, it's like, who brought what to this renaissance? So Janine Benyus is a wonderful, PhD biologist who many years ago founded green chemistry, non-toxic chemistry, and also what she calls biomimicry, which is rather than looting nature, why don't we borrow nature's recipes? Human technology is mostly poison and high temperature, but nature can't afford to do that because nature is experimenting with living things. You know, just, just one recent example, but there's a million. And also a crucial thing, you know, a website that is so useful to all of us, uh, she and E.O. Wilson, Harvard scientist, started this website called asknature.org. And if you go there, there's a little blank, and you can type in any question, and it will tell, you know, any conundrum, and it will tell you how nature solves it. So for instance, the Japanese government came to consult on biomimicry because their high-speed uh, bullet train, you know, uh, when, it, when it emerged from a tunnel, it would make a sonic boom, boom, right? And, you know, destroy houses and plates and everything. So they came, and, and Janine said, well, uh, let's look at the kingfisher who entered a bird that enters water without a splash. <laughs> and so they redesigned the front of the bullet train to be like a kingfisher bird. So it could move from one medium, like from air to water or tunnel to air, silently. And it worked. Wow. So these, are, these things that are so beautiful, you know, uh, again, you know, did you know? And see, did you know is part of the more we know, the more effective we are at this time of crossing borders. I go to CPAC, I talk to conservatives. You know, um, uh, it's, we, we want to talk to everybody, you know, to create this uh, irresistible magnetizing renaissance. 
you know, it's, it's like we, we might say the forces of doom and dementia, you know, row you bastards, you know, dominance, you know, um, <clears throat> um, you know, kind of destroying the world. I'm getting ready to kind of, you know, collapse. Uh, I, I like to note that most mainstream news or cable news is brought to us by Viagra because Empire just can't get it up anymore. Um, <laughs> you know, and so, so there's this uh, kind of, oh, wow, you bastard. Um, and then it's collapsing. But underneath that, here we go, team, is a culture of reverent and genius renaissance. And so it behooves all of us to be inviters. Come on over from the thing that's going down to this beautiful thing coming up. You know, it's like Alan Watts said, uh, no sense clinging to the rocks that are falling with you, right? It's like, come on over, come on over here. Um, so Sir Herbert Reed, great British anarchist, said, only those serving an apprenticeship to nature should be trusted with technology. And that's really where we're, where we're going, you know? And then this um, model, you know, anything that has a name has a god. So a long time ago, when I was at Findhorn in the north of Scotland, a um, pretty great community, you know, with its ideals about cooperating with nature, and sometimes the reality matched, and sometimes it didn't, you know. But, um, but, but it, Donald first came to visit. He was head of the World Federalists, uh, and he had a suit and looked completely conventional. And he talked about the Dog Hammarskjöld meditation room at the UN, full of spirits. Uh, and he said that there is an intelligence of the North Atlantic, Anything that has a name has a god, right? And I go, that's great. Look at this guy disguised as a grown-up, you know, saying these things. How wonderful! And what I love is, you know, democratic animism. It behooves us to experimentally cooperate with nature's guiding genius, you know. And um, you know, and, and and about everything, it's it's like uh, somebody came to me at a, you know, craft fair, a, a wise guy. Going, well, what do you think about the coming collapse in September? This was, you know, and we should all buy gold. And I go, well, that's you know. You know, a bunch of people scam, you know. But, but are we not alchemists and magicians? Where would we like economic collapse? How shall we direct that? Who is a good economic collapse? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. To the polluting industries. There you go, right? Which is what happened to Chevron. It just got too expensive to drill. Um, but also, I have friends and allies who were in the north when Chevron was attempting to install its drilling platform. And they said, out of the blue, you know, there was this giant iceberg on the horizon, and they were like, wow, that's unusual, where'd that come from? And it just made its way directly to the drilling rig, causing Chevron to go, this shouldn't happen, the worst could happen, like, whoa! You know, and then uh, the towboat towing the drilling rig broke down, and the towboat towing the towboat broke down, and then they were boarded by the EPA and cited for violations. We go, that was even without invitation. But, but the way it's kind of set up, you know, with indigenous people, is the, the backstage guys would like to help, you know, but we've got, we've got to be invited. And one of the purposes uh, one of art is that uh, it magnetizes power. So here we are at the vernal equinox. You know, and what's going on at equinoxes and solstices throughout time, you know, it's, it's our first form of magic theater. You know, O literal and symbolic light of sun, illuminate this writing, this painting, at the back of the cave. This is the story we want to animate. Like the muti from the South African Sangomas, we don't source power, uh, we invite it and we offer it a template. It says part of the, the purpose of dedicated art and beauty is it's the template. Dedicated acts of beauty invite power into the world. So, you know, it's, it's part of what I kind of came up with, a, 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 a term I coined, democratic animism. And it comes from two things that, um, that I carry with me always. So, years ago, when the radio show was starting, I hosted a Lakota elder, and, and I'd just gotten Stella Coyote as my assignment. And he would say, coyotes, nothing smarter. I mean, they are. And we want to be more like coyotes. Um, you know, I, I learned so much from Stella Coyote, giving, having been given a backstage. Yes, destruction, but incredible art. She had a whole art career going. Um, but, but he said, um, you know, we Lakota didn't hunt alone. Those gifted at trance would go backstage, in a sense, and they would broker a treaty or a working alliance. Um, and we would all hunt together with the wolves and coyotes for a season. And if you want to destroy a culture, destroy its capacity to partner across species borders. Mm -hmm. If you do that and even shame people out of it, you know, you can walk all over them, you know, which is, again, colonialism. So I love that. <coughs> and, you know, for, for all of us and the work that you, so many of you are dedicated to, you know, this capacity to go into a reverie trance, to go backstage, you know, and we would be one of those ancient people who emerged going, it wasn't easy, but we got a deal. The coyotes want half the leg and, you know, um, or the front leg and half the liver of every other deer, and the wolves are cool with that, and the deer are cool with that. Everybody back on stage. 
this capacity to negotiate backstage, this capacity to fill the memosphere with the desirable. And then at some point, we're going to pull the reality switch so that the desirable pours in. But see, Neptune and Pisces, to everybody here with the quality of work that you're dedicated to, you know, says, imagine that the deepest, most soulful part of each person here is about to be completely welcome. Welcome in the memosphere. You know, and so it wants to be a huge, you know, just entertain the possibility, a huge sigh of relief, like, whew, you know, we've made it to the right metaphoric climate to address the actual climate, you know, um, and that quality of, you know, the work that so many of you are devoted to, you know, that's been successful so far, but, but it says, no, no, more, more. It is time for sane reverence to assume cultural narrative lead, but in a non-polarizing way, in an irresistibly magnetizing way. There's a, a fantastic book called Finite and Infinite Games by James Carse. It's an old book, but even on the cover, it says a finite game's about winning, and infinite game's about keeping everything in play. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, the Renaissance was not primarily defined as against something. It was an irresistible invitation to the best of humanity to come participate in this thing. You know, and um, you know, and, and I, I do. I you know, I, I, I didn't go this year because it was way too toxic, but I've been to CPAC, the conference, whatever, the Conservative Political Action Conference, and met all the Dementors, but there are allies there. Um, oops, that's the wolves telling me that it's almost time to, yes, all right, there we go, we'll, we'll, we'll be wrapping this up kind of soon. But, um, so, but it just says, you know, what, whatever we speak to one another, you know, um, is the part of them we're inviting to dance with the corresponding part of ourselves. So the reason we don't want to judge someone is that we're inviting the least evolved part of them to dance with the least evolved part of us, and it's just never a pretty thing, right? And so this is where it's useful. It's, it's like, um, so, so at one of the CPACs I went to, there were, there were these Ayn Rand Austrian economists, you know, and they were following this guy who had an eye patch and a cane. And at first I was like, Phew. and it's like, no, no, compost her umfitude, compost her umfitude, because communication can only happen you know, synchronicity can only happen if you compost your attitude. So I was like, I, and they approached me because I always look like, you know, myself. And they go, <laughs> they go, who are you? And I go, what do you do? And I said, I'm Coyote Network News. I'm a mythological news service for the trickster redeemer within us all. And they said, that is so cool. Right? <laughs> See, if I said I'm an environmentalist, feminist, you know, no, no, none of that. You know, in fact, any IST, I mean, I'm sort of stuck with the, the name of my radio show is The Visionary Activist, so I'm kind of stuck with that. But any IST, see, there's no prison for the unexpected. If people have heard it, there's a prison, right? And this is, remember, our trickster knows how to escape. So, you know, being, you know, it's, it's like Corey going, hey, man, I'm flattered. You know, or, or just that disruptive, you know, again, it, it, just on simple levels, I was, I was working um, astrologically with a dentist who was raising two teenage sons who were hooligans. And he said he got back to the house every night, and the house was trashed, and pizza and beer everywhere, and he'd fly into a rage. And, and, and I said, well, you can't fake this, but it really only takes one person to change the dance. Uh, and he goes, I'll try. And then he reported back, and he goes, that was really interesting. He said, I got back, the house was trashed like it always is, and he said, I, I looked around calmly, and there were the sons waiting for the explosion, and I just said to them, I'm going to the movies. So he said he went to the movies, and when he got back, the house was like, Spotless, right? They were freaked out. It's like, no, we do this, and then you get enraged. And, but you, we don't know what to do with ourselves, right? So again, see, the unexpected liberates everybody. And so even at the CPAC thing, um, my friends who were there were like, uh, let's smuggle you into the Reagan cocktail party. I go, okay. So, so this guy comes up, and he goes, you know, I was wearing a wolf amulet, and he's like, wolves. And I told him about the wolf model of leadership and how admirable it was and how it would be great for humans to replace our befoibled leadership process. Because see, see no, no creatures in nature would outsource their leadership you know, to a sociopathic you know, dingbat. I mean, <laughs> wolves would never do that. So the wolf model of leadership is, you know, because I lived with a hybrid wolf for a long time, which is how I could have Stella Coyote, because, but, but very different civilizations, wolves and coyotes, but they got on. Um, but the wolves don't operate on dominance, they operate on charisma. And in wolf culture, charisma means who initiates play best. Mm -hmm. not, not just play, let's go hunting, but play is at the top of their list of, of leadership criterion. And you can tell the alpha wolf within 10 days of birth because it's the wolf pup with the lowest 
resting heartbeat, right? So it's the coolest wolf who engages the playful ingenuity of the pack. And it's like, that's a leadership model, you know, we'd like, right? And that's really great. So I told this guy that, and he's like, oh, that's really cool. And then he said, um, I own the largest privately owned boat in the world. And I go, so you must love the ocean. And he goes, I do. <laughs> um, you know, and then we talked about Joseph Campbell, and he's like, Joseph Campbell, I used to have a mythological, come be my date at the Reagan banquet, right? Okay, so it turns out he's like a platinum Republican. I mean, he's, everybody's like, whatever they think. And what, what, what's interesting is, he, and he took a photo, I, I have an amazing photo uh, of us, and you can see within him, you know, um, is this part of him that wants the mythological part of him spoken to, again, um, and then the Republican part of him, which is like, ah, yeah. And I mean, it's like there's, there's a demonic war that's blazing out through his eyes. Um, and at one point, uh, he says, uh, George W. Bush, one of the greatest presidents ever. And I said, um, for as long as I've known you, which was like 20 minutes, um, <laughs> I've, I've never heard you say such a silly thing. I, I, think, I, I think you're possessed. And he's like, possessed? Uh, again, another unusual <laughs> concept. Uh, he goes, but he kind of liked it. Anyway, so, so then, you know, again, surprise. People like to be surprised, you know. Um, and, and it wasn't finger waggy, it was just sort of an objective report on his state. Um, <laughs> so then he sent me the photo, and I got to see, you know, he's CEO of Petroleum Inc. So I'm like, holy, you know, holy moly. Um, so, so I, you know, we're all undercover agents. So having his email, I, I sent him Amory Lovin's, you know, green energy plan that Amory had created for the military. Because the military is, you know, they know the global crisis is a huge thing. Um, you know, and, um, and he wrote back, I, I made him a little bit of a cartoon, but he wrote back a surprisingly reflective email, and he said, oh, I remember Amory from the 70s, when we were all working on the early prototypes of solar panels, you know. But what I don't trust is the economics part. Mm -hmm. So I go back to our team of ingenious, inventive people, and they go, feed them, feed them money <coughs> in economics, you know. Feed them the story of how, you know, ingenious, you could, you could do non-horrible things and also make money and this could work. <laughs> so there was that. Um, so, um, so there's the, the there's the Lakota <clears throat> um, uh, operate with, with wolves and coyotes, and then a wonderful friend of mine, disguised as a psychologist. Um, so she's also an archaeologist, and she said um, she, she's coined fun phrases too. She says, "What if the idea of matriarchy is a patriarchal concept?" <laughs> That's really fun. She goes, "As opposed to actual equality, right?" Yeah. And we go, yeah. "Right." I mean. Equality would look like a matriarchy because things are so whacked out, but, but it was a fun thing. It's, it's sort of spicy. Um, and then she said, you know, the modern concept of worship is so silly. You know, you are great, now give me this thing. And she said, in hunter-gatherer societies and throughout the Mediterranean, she says there was great reverence and respect between the incarnationally sensual onstage manifest and the backstage invisible mystery. But she said it was a much more collaborative relationship the invisible seeks incarnational invitation as much as we seek communion with it. I go, that's fabulous. You know, you know, um, and so that idea of you know, democratic animism, wheel and deal, you know, backstage wheel and deal. And see, dealing with a coyote, we, we, you know, we've taught dogs shame. Dogs know shame, like, oh, coyotes, no. Um, you know, only, only telepathic wheel and deal. So in the 19 years I spent with Stella Coyote, discipline now, um, but, but I would put my forehead to hers, she, she loved that, right, and I'd go, let's make a deal. You know, so when she first came, you know, uh, the wolf dog and I were kind of appalled, the cultures are different, and every night at 2 a.m., Stella Kai would run around the house and gather things, you know, underwear, stones, art, and she'd put them in a circle and she'd throw them in the air and animate them and, and bite them, and then she'd run around and bite me and the wolf dog, and the wolf dog and I were like, whoa, what, what is this? So I put my little forehead to her and I go, Coyote, I can see you're a great artist, <laughs> so here's our deal. You know, you're giving up a lot of freedom, but you're getting some security back, and you love Munda, um, and I can see you're a great artist. So I, my deal is I will provide you art supplies, and I think Coyote see color, because she like sort of Tibetan prayer plaid stuff. Um, and in return, you know, so you don't need to do this bitey thing. Right, and she never did that again. She did many other horrible things, but she didn't do that. <laughs> you know? And uh, very often with Coyote, you know, um, admiration would <laughs> aggravation. Um, once she um, took a bucket of water from the bathtub, hopped out with it, poured it on the carpets, and then lay down on it going, Coyote air conditioning. I'm like, that's very <laughs> impressive. You know, now I have to plaster the ceiling below it. But it was very impressive. 
So a, a lot of those things. So again, this, this kind of wheel and deal. If this, then that. I give you this. And see, it's, it's what you know, anthropologists call transactional spirituality. It's, it's Vodun, it's New Orleans, you know, it's whatever. It's, it's a wheel and deal spicy thing. You know, um, you know, if I do this, you give me that. No, no, how about this? How about two? Okay, we got a deal. Um, and again, working with indigenous activists too, this is the, the one thing that can really work. When the, when the Uwa in Colombia, their lands were threatened by Standard Oil. So the Uwa, Standard Oil was going to destroy their lands, and the Uwa thought at first, we will kill ourselves if, if our land is destroyed. But then they thought, no, wait. So they did serious ritual, and they invited the oil to hide. And Standard Oil did three drillings, came up dry, packed their bags, and left. Okay. So I, this is the kind of thing I work with. My friends in Hawaii, there was a, a bad project that was going to involve mowing down uh, virgin forest to build some power thing. Um, and again, inviting the gods. And let's say gods and goddesses are metaphoric animations of intrinsic intelligence in nature. Um, and so they invited Pele, you know, the volcano goddess. Uh, with chanting and singing. And so every time there was laying a cornerstone, Pele lava would erupt. And the scientists would like, we studied this, this shouldn't be happening, we're gonna do it again. Right? And, and it would erupt again, and then they were like, we're just tiptoeing away, there we go. Um, so this, this realm of ingenious cooperation, and I think you know, the cultivation of our brains and our capacities you know, is all really crucial. It, it goes with um, a buddy, Martin Prechtel, saying manners. Human, you know, he's a sort of Guatemalan shaman guy. Um, but he goes, humans and manners, right? May our species have manners. And, um, you know, predator prey in nature have manners. I, I once had two <coughs> PhDs in predator prey relations on the show, and they, they, bought, they made it, and it was great. Um, but they said, you know, uh, a hawk over a prairie dog, you know, um, if it's circling, and the prairie dog's close to its den, it will wiggle its eyebrows going, close to my den, don't waste your energy. And the hawk goes, thank you very much, I'll eat you later. Okay, so <laughs> manners. So Martin says, manners, you know, was the oil in the ocean invited to come out? Was the oil invited to become plastic? Was the plastic invited to become a computer? You know, and this idea of animism, you know, when I was talking to a, a woman about Taurus and animism, she goes, yeah, I'm a Taurus. And she said, I make stone walls and they last forever because I always invite the stones to hang together before I begin. And kahunas in Hawaii said, this is the essence of the kahuna magic, that they would walk through the land you know, before a big project, and they would ask what stones wanted to be part of the project, and the stones that volunteered would carry half their, way, half their weight, says the legend. Good, it's a good story anyway. And we go, right, all of those things, you know, that, that quality of Taurus animation. So, um, so, so I love you know science you know being rewedded, you know, because because cultures embedded their scientific knowledge symbolically in fairy tales and myths. Inanna myth is the astronomical cycle of Venus, um, but there's also I'll just reference not go into it deeply, but there's a fantastic essay on the fairy tale Rapunzel uh, by William Irwin Thompson, in which he absolutely teases from it the entire history of sex and biology on the planet, the orbital cycle of the Moon, Mars, and Venus. You know, and, and other things that are really packed in there, just as a little footnote. Did, how many people know the fairy tale Rapunzel? Right. Well, oh God, everybody, that's great. So remember, it begins with the pregnant woman, you know, and she's looking up and over the wall into the witch's garden, which is looking backwards in time, right? And she sees this rampion, this this uh, Rapun Rapunzel, this plant that she really wants to eat. You know, and then she sends her husband up and over, and it's always in a fairy tale. It's always a difficult thing for the husband to go, you know, into the witch's garden, right? And then, um, you know, he, the, the the daughter is promised. So, so, so Thompson says, well, in researching Rapunzel and Rampy on this plant, it's probably good for pregnant people. Um, uh, let me back up just a smidge. Um, so he says, um, in the history of biology and life on this planet, at first we had what's called mother-daughter cells. It's just cells duplicating themselves. So there's no sex, there's no individuality, and so there's no death. Once we get sex, we get death. I go, how interesting. Right, once we get sex, we get the birth of an individual, which is why we can have death. And it's like, that's really cool. So in his researching you know, Rapunzel and Rampion, he goes, oh, it's even cooler. The plant is the story. Rampion is, is, is as a plant, it grows up straight like a tower, and it sends out two golden braids to attract pollination. And it's one of those plants that can have sex, 
Now, it can self-pollinate, but it prefers sex, right? So, it's, so I just love that, that the plant is, it's like, to that. Okay, so, so, what happened is, so what happened with the alleged enlightenment is the unsupervised boys team said, we don't need these myths and fairy tales and symbolic languages like astrology. Fuck, we want just science and knowledge, right? And so what it did was it stripped science and knowledge from its mythological moral cocoon that all science be used with dedication to collective well-being. And part of what's clearly happening here and all over is the re-wedding you know, of myth, magic, and science. Again, they, they love each other. These are all false estrangements brokered as a mean trick of the reality police to render people you know, incompetent and sane. You know, um, you know, I love Lauren Isley, a, a, a great biologist who really was a mystic. Um, you know, he said so many beautiful things, but he said, we are rag dolls made out of many ages and skins, changelings who have slept in wood nests or hissed in the uncouth guise of waddling amphibians. We have played such roles for infinitely longer ages than we have been human. Our identity is a dream. We are process, not reality. For reality is an illusion of the daylight, the light of our particular day. Um, and, and I love him saying also, though men in the mass forget the origins of their need, they still bring wolfhounds into city apartments where dog and man both sit brooding in wistful discomfort, right? <laughs> anyway, so, um, and other many beautiful things too. But the last little bit about you know, the incredible respect for the incredible intelligence of so much around us. You know, um, you know, I host a lot of biologists on the radio show that I do, <clears throat> and um, uh, Stephen Buhner, uh, interesting biologist, says, um, you know, trees, if they're attacked by, attacked by a beetle, they'll put up with it at a certain point, but once it crosses a respectful boundary, that tree then manufactures the pheromone that will attract the predator of that beetle. Wow. And then it, at the same time, it puts out a public service announcement to other trees going, rude insects coming, start making the pheromone now. Right? And then the beautiful work of this uh, forest biologist, uh, Suzanne Simard, about trees talk to each other through the mycelia, through the soil. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we might want to be revisiting is, when did the underworld become a bad place? Mm -hmm. Who made that happen? Mm -hmm. Because in many of the myths, you know, the Pluto and Persephone myth, for instance, a uh, wonderful scholar said, it's told many ways. And the rape and pillage stuff of Pluto is way late, way late. One of the earliest versions of Pluto and Persephone, the Pluto figure is called Pharmacia. It's plant medicine that takes us to the underworld of initiation, where we go down a little boy or a little girl and return an initiated wizard, you know, and, and whatever. And that's part of the image of the Venus emerging now. We, we've gone down into the underworld, we've stripped off our little girl and our little boy costumes, we're in a wardrobe change, we're, we're back with backup. You know, and um, so what Suzanne says, you know, she, she did these experiments that say trees, you know, they're not competing. Um, they're, they're incredibly concerned about each other. She said, Cyprus in a world of its own, but Aspen and Fir talking to each other, going, do you need more carbon? Do you need, more, do you need shade? Do you need this thing? Um, and it's all this competing. And what she says is, um, the mycelia, well, it's all mycelia, the underworld. And, and I work a lot with Paul Stamets, and we could go on forever. I'll, I'll tighten this up here. Um, but but the, the incredible amount that mushrooms and mycelia um, uh, can do for us, clean up diesel oil spills, uh, agaricon, which grows in old growth forests, is a cure for cancer. And he, he's been talking to, before this administration with the Department of Defense um, because it's also a cure for anthrax and many other extraordinary things. But it only grows in old growth forests. So he was working with the Department of Defense to declare the preservation of old growth forests as national defense. Right, we're, 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 we're just an inch away, we're going to come back for that. Um, and so, um, you know, what, what Suzanne Simard says, um, they communicate, the trees communicate by sending mysterious chemical and hormonal signals to each other by the mycelia to determine which trees need more carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, which trees have some to spare, sending the elements back and forth to each other until the entire forest is balanced. The web is so dense, there can be hundreds of kilometers of mycelia under a single footstep. The mycelia web connects mother trees with baby trees, allowing them to feed their young. A single mother tree can provide, yes, just one more snooze, okay. A single mother tree can provide nourishment for hundreds of smaller trees in the understory of her, brushes, of her branches. Mother trees even recognize their own kin, sending them more mycelia and carbon and reducing their own root size to make room for their babies. This new understanding of tree communication has, sim, you know, Simard increasingly appalled it. Clear cutting, right? And then, and then monoculture. It's like no, it's a conversation. It's a civilization. You know, again, 
Our word human comes from humus, dirt, from which we get the word humble. You know, the word human says we are meant to be humble people in the dirt. You know, we're meant to be, you know, in, in the nourishing underworld. You know, and so she has a whole remedy, other things like that. See my website. Okay, so, um, so this realm of democratic animism, yes, you've heard about that. Um, and part of it is, you know, if we all have affinities, you know, plants, animals that we love, we're invited by this beautiful language of astrology to think of our lives as spiritual detective novels. That every quirky affinity that we have is a clue worthy of honoring and pursuing. So, you know, I, I, we all have different affinities. <clears throat> so it says to protect water, become more like water. To protect wolves, become more like wolves. Um, become more like what we seek to form an alliance with, as the Lakota, as the Lakotas led. Um, and um, so we might um, throw everything into the cauldron, in a way, all, <coughs> all past teachings, and say, um, does it guide people to their own autonomy? Is it equal Mars and Venus, masculine and feminine? Is it equal in its consideration of humans and the rest of our flora, fauna, kin? Can the truth be said without cringing? Is trickster welcome? Yes, we ladle it out. No, we throw it back in for another round of bubbling. So I think uh, um, I, I like, I like uh, the phrase that I've coined, entheo endogenous indigenuity. You could even <laughs> chant it with me. Entheo endogenous <laughs> indigenuity. That's close enough for mythological words. <laughs> um, so you know, entheo, kinship, right? The entheogenic plants, endogenous within us, indigenuity, you know, it, it lives in us and it's, and it's quickening. It's quickening. So I will <clears throat> leave us all with, um, with, with this blessing. You know, it says, we each carry a unique and necessary medicine for our times. We're invited to rephrase to replace the, the word trauma with our dangerous, beautiful assignment. Because it says, you know, redemption lies in brewing medicine for others. Because I've been in so many groups where people are talking about my trauma, not, not here, which has been, I haven't written the word trauma once here, which is fantastic. Um, but, um, but in different groups, you know, people go, my trauma, my trauma, what is your trauma? I forgot, but, my, but I know it's bigger than anybody else. And it's like, some people forgot. Now there is real trauma, but, but I, I really earned this one. <coughs> in a number of ways. And, and I know that, you know, our dangerous, beautiful assignment, be, because whatever we've been through, if we brew medicine for others in similar circumstances, it's, it's healing to everybody. And so the last word, there's a wonderful word, and I'm, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> apparently very moving to myself, but um, <laughs> there, there's an Eret a wonderful Eritrean world word, Aizan. And it's a blessing bestowed on, on everyone you know, setting forth on a, on a worthy but dangerous journey, a blessing of support, you know, and so we just might say to each other, I is on. I is on. Is on. Thank you, team. The only uh, one of the outer planets you didn't talk about is Saturn. I'm just wondering what that, what's going on there. Well, Saturn is um, not an outer planet because um, we can see Saturn, right? So, so we have um, a seven-day week because of seven visible planets. That's, that's really the only reason. Um, but Saturn, no, it's a great question. Saturn is our authority. It's our wolf leadership dynamic. You know, um, and so the model is we want to insource what we've been outsourcing. We've outsourced our Saturn, our authority and our autonomy. You know, and uh, I'd like to say, he, you know, he who hesitates gets bossed, right? So meaning, you know, we, so we all want to inhale our authority from the past reaches of disbursement. You know, everybody autonomous with their own wise Saturn. Uh, the totem, uh, we're talking to you about the, the Saturn goat. You know, um, Saturn is our goat, right? And, and when, when somebody gets our goat, that comes from uh, race horses were given a companion goat that calmed them down. And bad people before a race would get a horse's goat, leaving it all frantic. So if somebody gets our goat, you know, then we want to see our goat returning, you know, friskier, 
ungettable, unscapable, and more disobedient than before it got God. Right? And so right now Saturn is also in its own sign of Capricorn. Dum, 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 dum. Um, and it is, I mean, excavate the, the chart here. So, yeah, <clears throat> so Saturn is how we define the leadership. And, and a moment like this you know, is, is a perfect moment for everyone to go, what is our definition of leadership, of desirable leadership? And that was always the model, you know, when, when Venus would go to the underworld, even in Mesoamerica, it would be like, oh, time to redefine leadership, you know, and, and to welcome that back. Leadership in our own lives, you know, but also internal dedication grows the form for the creative project, as opposed to trying to stuff it into a pre-existing form. So there's, there's a lot, um, uh, a lot, you know, one, one could keep going uh, onward, but, but Saturn is now conjoining Mars, I'll, I'll say this and translate it, and it's got a, a quintile, a, a beautiful, elegant, 72 degree <coughs> angle, what we get when we divide the circle by five, five is sacred to Venus, uh, to Neptune. So it says the protoplasm of reality is especially receptive to imaginative imprint right now. I mean, the, the backstage gods are trying to help us out, going, trying to help the humans out, going, if you, know, if you can imagine it, wedded to dedication, you know, there's a lot of support kind of coming in for that. You know, and also the absolute reality of the imaginative and the visionary to incarnate into actual structural forms. And that's what, you know, we are incredibly wealthy with ingenious solutions to horrific problems. You know, it's a question of leadership to apply that. But that's also the invitation. You know, and part of the incompetence of leadership and cruelty and tyranny all over the world, you know, it says, well, it behooves all of us then, you know, to assume cultural narrative lead, but also all these projects and design things, and to, you know, and to invite people, you know, come on over to that. So, is Saturn beloved by you? Well, I just happened to notice the omission because you went in as far as Jupiter, but you didn't mention Saturn. Well, that's right. No, I didn't mention a lot of people because we need a, we need a day. Well, you mentioned from Pluto in, but you skipped Saturn. <coughs> right. Yeah. Well, you know, time. <coughs> which, is, which is Saturn's model? <laughs> so, so, you know, a, a fun thing. Eliphas Levy said, um, "Let us imagine ourselves as though we were kings and queens with all eternity before us." As, as one model. And then on the other hand, you know, it's bleeping and dangerous right now too, um, but it's also about slow down in order to speed up. And, and at a certain point, uh, I was giving um, a talk to uh, organic growers and, and uh, a town out in California. Um, and I was talking about slow way down to speed up, and they came up afterwards and they said, all of your metaphors are our facts. And I go, ooh. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, the more, when you irrigate a field, the more you slow it down with berms, the faster it infiltrates, right? So the more we slow down in gatherings like this, the faster we infiltrate. Right? And then it's like, let all natural facts be social strategy metaphors. You know, um, that's again the essence of biomimicry, and don't forget asknature.org and all of these things. Again, <clears throat> it's a partnering. It's humans rejoining the garden. Uh, I love an indigenous friend of mine went to Africa and uh, was working with um, missionaries there. And she, in her innocence, said, now let me get this straight. In your story, you got kicked out of the garden, right? Um, and they're like, yes. And she said, well, in our story, we never left the garden, so we'll help you out. <laughs> <laughs> and they were cool with that. They were okay with that. But um, are, are, are you no, restless? No, no, I'm just... <laughs> yes, darling? I have a question. We have the threat of a gas... <laughs> <laughs> I have a pipeline. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you do. And in all that you've presented, what would be the best way to invite this... Oh this Atlantic Coast Pipeline, which threatens to go through and destroy the bucolic beauty of our area, yeah. and, to ca and it is already causing distress amongst many families mm -hmm. and places of business here in, from, from West Virginia to North Carolina. Right. And it's going right through here for our own area. What would be a way to in invite, is what I heard you say, when you are Right. Well, with, with anything, when, when there's too much, you know, again, Mars unsupervised, you know, in all mythology, Mars without Venus, you know, is <coughs> hyper yang death frenzy. You know, um, so if there's too much Mars, then in, in some way, you know, again, intrinsic to here, you would be making an alliance, you, you would be in, invite, well, that, that this would be a, a useful good day for, for us to think about, but, um, but when I was with the Council of Unreasonable Women, um, it was when there was a plan to um, store nuclear waste under, under Yucca Mountain. And, 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 and so I, I was talking to them about the Uwa and everything. And, and um, 
Uh, I said, well, how about we invite Yucca Mountain to, to reveal her um, opinion about this proposal? And they were like, well, you know, okay, what the hell? The next day, earthquakes, right? Uh, Yucca Mountain causing like, oh, maybe it's unstable. Uh, again, this idea of partnering, and always, you know, my, my, my fallback is, you know, um, when we don't know what to do, invite in what does, right? And always invite in trickster. You know, and give it models going, well, this would be fun, uh, or how about this, or we don't know, come on in, you know, what would be amazing? <clears throat> I would also, again, just, you know, not, not specific, but, but relevant, you know, um, there's a place in, in Baja, the San Ignacio Lagoon, which is an amazing place. It's where the gray whales seek contact with humans. And it's after a, a horrible, it's, it's where they breed and give birth, and humans for centuries were killing them, and so they were very you know, fierce and protective um, and, and, and would kill humans. And one day, it was the same day that the UN passed marine mammal protection, this gray whale came up to Pancho Marimau, a little fisherman's boat, and he was terrified, but it wouldn't go away until he began to stroke it. And, um, and then from that moment on, I've been there twice, um, the whales only there seek communion. They come up and they play with you, and they're, they're bigger than the boat, but you know, it's just fantastic. Um, and you weep. You, you weep for the, the beauty and the play and the kinship of it. And the scientists, hard-nosed scientists, go, I think the whales are forgiving us. And so Mitsubishi was going to destroy that lagoon, and the president of Mexico had agreed. Um, but the fisherman, <coughs> Pancho Mayoral's son, told me, he said, so the fishermen got together, the local fishermen, and they invited the president to come out in the boat with his wife and his um, child. Um, and he said the whales knew what they had to do. You know, he said they'd never been so beguiling. So like, look at us, and, <laughs> and, and everybody on the boat, and the and the president's wife and child, you're just screaming with tears because it's so fabulously beautiful. Um, and the president's heart was softened, and he canceled the plan. And so I, I I say this to grumpy progressive team and everything, going, you know, the whales did not go. You running dog lackeys for imperialism, you know? And it's like, no, we're just going to break your heart wide open. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, and so in those quirky synchronicity ways, like who knows what, who, what about this thing? What does, it's it's not simple. It's a huge thing, and it's and I work with a lot of the Standing Rock people too. You know, and again, it, it's it's <clears throat> it's a huge issue, but it's gathering force, and and the rise of the Parkland youth, you know, and the outspoken wolfiness uh, and the sensibility of, you know, yes, yes, the, the gun owners here, you know, perfectly one, but assault rifles are insane. Um, because they, they are designed, you know, the doctor at Parkland said, you know, I wish you could see what I do, a bullet will go straight through. These bullets from assault rifle, they're designed to tumble, so they explode your organ, right? It's like, there's no reason for that, um, this addiction to hyperboom. But anyway, so, so back to this, you know, crucial big thing, but yes, well, let's stay in touch, right? And all the resources, but, but also ask, you know, how does nature protect itself? You know, um, in what way? Forming a deeper alliance to the land. You know, in, in some not simple, you know, again, the standing rock thing, going, but, but it's a turning point in the Parkland youth rising up so articulate, so expressive. It says, you know, it's like Marie Laveau, great voodoo queen of New Orleans, it was written of her, Marie Laveau did not create cultural movements, because these movements are sweeping through. We want to be available. You know, Jornis Trickster says to all of us, I'm going to connect you, you know, and you and you to, to the coolest things possible, the kind of synchronicity that makes one bark with laughter. You know, all I want from you is willingness. And we go, we're willing, you know. And the backstage gods go, they've hoisted their sails of willingness, let's go. Um, you know, and that idea of, you know, available for play, um, announcing available for play against all odds, right? It's an against all odds thing. Um, and so we, we, you know, we look to, to all of that. But, but part of the beauty of this language, we, it says each planetary part of us, the, the inner democracy of each one of us, separated by a thin membrane from the whole pulse and collective, has a different function. Saturn is a part of us that I think is, in, in some ways, least understood. Saturn is really good at setting intention, defining things, making vows. But it's terrible at, well, how are we going to do this? We go, that's not Saturn's job. Jupiter and Uranus chime in and go, you tell us what, Saturn, we'll do how in a way that makes you bark with laughter. You know, so the, the deep dedication and then the availability going, this is our dedication, we don't know how, you know, but we're available. You know, so it just increases the mystical, evolutionary, experimental dynamic. Good? Good. Okay. Thank you.